Hi guys, I'm Olu. I'm Marty. Thank you for joining us. We are Potter's House One Surf, based in Clapham Junction. Welcome. Just a quick one. At the end of this month, we'll be having um, a game of rounders, not baseball, I believe. No, rounders, because um, we're in London. Yes, yes, not, not America, okay? Yeah. Um, we're ranked <laughs> 25 versus another level. Good times, good vibes. If you, if you think you can bat a leg, you know, bat a ball, one a leg or two, it'd be good for you to come through as well. Um, this week, Pull to the announcement, listen up from your ears. Pastor Jay will be coming into town, clapping junctions. It's going to be in house as well, coming to ooh, preach ooh, the ooh, word. Ooh, ooh. Powerful and, um, preacher, anointed man, please don't miss out on his word. It's, we're going to be in house, we're going to be online as well. So, people that may not make it, it's going to be online as well. Um, Saturday as well, we're going to be meeting in the park as so well. We've fellowship with the Saints. So, if you want to um, be a part of this, please speak to your connect group leaders. If not, please get in touch with Pastor Miles, Pastor Brandon, if not Pastor Courtney. Over to you, Martin. Guys, most importantly, let's stay faithful in our giving. Even in this time, we're seeing that God is blessing people with their finances. So please, please do not forget God and let's stay faithful within our giving. Most importantly, if you're about to watch this video and you enjoy it, hopefully you do enjoy it and hopefully it does edify you. Please like and subscribe below. You're going to see the like button is like a thumb and then the subscribe button. You're going to see that also the subscribe button is going to give you notifications. We hope that this video that you're about to watch blesses and edifies you. Thank you guys for that introduction. I uh, just want to welcome you for myself, Potter's House Wandsworth. We pray that you and your family are well. Um, just want to say, uh, let's just continue to pray for one another. We've been having good services on the, a Sunday. People are, you know, they're coming back and uh, they're really grateful for that. Obviously, sometimes it's a bit unnerving with everything that's been going on. So let's pray for one another, uh, that God will just encourage us, give us courage, uh, uh, even reach out to people and just to check that everybody's okay. It's good for us to be uh, a family to care for one another and look out for one another. Uh, also pray for us as a church. Uh, coming in September, we're going to start to have uh, praise and worship. We're starting slower. Uh, again, because of the way the government uh, advisory and regulations, all those things, we can't have everybody singing, but we are going to start to have the praise and worship on a Sunday. Uh, on a Wednesday in September, we're going to commence with live streaming the services. That means there'll be some limited spaces. So uh, I guess if you if you want to attend those, then uh, we're going to have a list up for that. And you can let me know if you want to do that or speak to one of your connect group leaders. But we're going to start slow with that. And we're, we're, we're slowly, slowly getting back to some type of uh, normality. Uh, last thing I wanted to mention, there is a men's D, uh, 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 an area-wide men's D um, at the Warfenstow Church, and so that will be on their link. And so that's going to be on Thursday, which will be tomorrow uh, when you're watching this. So that's going to be Thursday and Friday. Um, there's, there's two sessions each day, starts at uh, 10 a.m., um, and so all of the, the slots have been allocated for you to, who, who, those that want to actually attend um, at the building, but it's going to be online as everything is nowadays. So if you want to get more information about that, speak to one of your, uh, the Connect Group leaders and I'm sure they can help you with that. All right, let's get into the word for today. Luke 7 verse 11, we're going, that's what we're going to be reading. Um, Oh, many years ago, before I was a pastor, I was the uh, a youth leader in the South London congregation. And from time to time, me and my wife, we would drop some of the young people home on a Wednesday after church. Um, their parents would be, you know, they want them to come to church, but they'd be like, how are they going to get home? So we'd be like, don't worry, we'll get them home. And so we would drop them uh, home. And so I remember one of the days, uh, there was a young guy and his his family was in the church, but we was giving him a, a lift home. And um, we actually had a collision. Another car just pulled, went straight across the road and uh, hit the car. And uh, thankfully, nobody was injured. It was just uh, uh, airbags went up and uh, it was a bit more of a shock than anything. But I was thinking about as this, you know, we're going one way, he's going another way. But because we collided, what we were doing stopped. That was it. There was no progress at that point in time. And I was thinking about in the history of mankind, there's been two major collisions that have affected every single human being on this planet. The first collision is mankind and sin. Sin collided with mankind. Here is in the book of Genesis, God has made us, man is starting this new existence, this new life, and then almost feels like out of nowhere, sin just collides with mankind and mankind is off course. Uh, that's a tragic one, uh, but the, the, the hopeful one is the second one, is that 
when sin is really uh, on course in mankind, we see it from Genesis, after that collision, sin is just running through mankind, Jesus collides with sin. And this is the beauty of it, that sin no longer could continue on its course. Sin could no longer have dominion and a rough ride uh, uh, over mankind because Jesus Christ sees it and Jesus Christ collides with sin. And when we look in the New Testament, what we really see is, is Jesus is colliding with lives. And, and rather than this collision making everything terrible, this collision changes everything for the better. So I'm going to um, look into one of these uh, collision so to speak where Jesus comes into a connection with somebody's life and changes the situation because I believe that he wants to do the same for us today and so I'm going to preach a sermon do not weep from Luke 7 verse 11 now the Bible says this now it happened the day after that he went to a city called uh, Nain and many of his disciples went with him and a large crowd and when he came near the gate of the city behold a dead man was being carried out the only son of his mother and she was a widow and a large crowd from the city was with her when the lord saw he had compassion on her and he said to her do not weep then he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still and he said young man i say to you arise so he who was dead sat up and began speaking and he presented him to his mother. Let's pray. Father, we ask you right now for your grace, your mercy. I pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit be upon this message. Wherever we're watching this, Father, I pray that you would speak to us. I pray most of all, Lord, that you would magnify yourself in Jesus' name. And all God's people says, Amen. Let me, uh, it, this is, you know, it's a clear, clear cut uh, narrative of what was happening with Jesus and this woman um, and what we see here is many things kind of coming together many things colliding even in this one text first of all what we see is two enemies colliding we see death and life they are uh, death and life are enemies they cannot coincide they cannot both prosper at the same time and so we see the death of this man and the life of Jesus the prince of life uh, co uh, collide together the second thing we see is two sons coming into contact with each other we see the son of the widow dead in the coffin and we see the son of God full of life coming to save humanity not only are they two sons they're two only sons because that was the widow's only son and Jesus is God's only son we see two directions the Bible says that as the funeral party was going out of the city because they would bury people outside the city they wouldn't bury people inside of the city as they're going out Jesus is coming in. We see this as a perfect picture of the gospel that when sin was leading us out, when sin was leading mankind out, Christ came in. And just as in this thing, Christ steps in and speaks that there is peace and that there is hope and that there is a future in him. This is the gospel. But one of the main things I want to uh, focus on, the two crowds. There are two large crowds. So there's two enemies, two sons, two directions. But there's two large crowds in this text that are going to uh, collide. The Bible says in verse 11, And many of the disciples went, went with him and a large crowd. Then in verse 12, she was a widow and a large crowd from the city was with her. So imagine you're here looking at this situation and you're seeing this, this funeral procession and a large crowd come in and they're weeping and they're crying and all of those things. And then you're seeing this other crowd coming into the city led by Jesus and people are laughing and joking. And we know how uh, church people can be. We're just loud sometimes when we're fellowshipping and here, here they are. I mean, we can be in church and we're just loud after church and, and, and hearing a word and people praying and being excited in fellowship. Imagine how you'd be when Jesus is actually with you. And so we see these two crowds about to collide. One is with Jesus. One is with uh, the dead son. One is following the, uh, uh, the prince of life. And one is following a man who has lost his life. See, 
uh, these two crowds would have been very different. We see one rejoicing uh, with an expectation of new life, new things. And one is weeping with an expectation of just a new grave. That's all we see. We see that there is one crowd which is following a living hope. Here is Jesus. He's going to bring new hope. Here is another crowd following a hopeless situation. I want to say that every single human being now or forever in history is in one of two crowds. Either you are in a crowd following a living hope or you are in a crowd following a, situ a hopeless situation. That, 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 that really is it in life. We can, uh, you could be uh, uh, pro this and anti that, but if Jesus ain't in it, that's just a hopeless situation. We've seen political campaigns where we've hope, hope, and people can be in uh, politics for a while. And then after they're gone, then the same situation comes back, hopelessness. Because uh, there is nothing that can give us true hope other than the Son of God. We are following dead situations. The, the Bible shows us is that this is almost like a spiritual analogy of all of humanity who is in one or two crowds. One crowd following Jesus where he's leading them into a city. And if you are following Christ, then he is leading you to an eternal city. He's leading you into eternity. The other crowd, they're just being led to a cemetery. And how many times people are just living their life, they're being led in a hopeless situation. They're being led by drugs or being led by alcohol or being led by a gang or being led by just uh, 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 empty things as this world. Because everything in this world, let me just say this now, everything in this world is eventually leading you to the cemetery. Whether it's money, whether it's marriage, whether it's a, 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 a job, whether it's a career, an education, those things are not bad, but they cannot be our hope. I've said this a few times, but it bears repeating that, yes, uh, marriage is good. I'm married. Uh, 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 you know, obviously my wife is married to me and we love each other, but one of us will probably go before the other one. And that is how life mainly goes. And so here you are. It, it cannot be your hope. That cannot be the thing that's leading you because it will always, anything other than Jesus, if you've made anything your hope, other than Jesus, it is leading you to the cemetery. Eventually, it will fail. Eventually. And Jesus uh, sees, uh, Jesus is with one crowd and he sees this other crowd. And what I'm so grateful for is that Jesus doesn't leave the other crowd. Jesus doesn't just let the other crowd go by. They're heading towards the cemetery. Jesus steps in and he's willing to uh, interrupt that crowd and Jesus maybe you're in that crowd you're in the crowd that's just following everybody heading towards a cemetery heading towards death and when you die and stand before God there is nothing left for you other than rejection by God because you haven't accepted Christ I want to tell you Jesus is stepping in Jesus is stepping in today if you're watching this someone sent this to you Jesus is stepping in and he's saying listen do not weep I want to give you hope I want to come into your life. I want you in my crowd. Jesus is always recruiting new recruits for his gang. Jesus has a gang. They're called disciples. They're called the church. And he is leading us into an eternal city, a place of hope and a place of joy. See, when I look at this text, what I believe is that uh, from my perspective, from my opinion, this is one of the saddest situations in the Bible. I really do believe this is one of the saddest situations because let's just look at the text again. It says a dead man was being carried out. Now that's sad. Someone dies. This dead man is being carried out. It's a funeral, obviously. The only son of his mother, that's sad. I mean, it's bad that any child would die. No parent wants to bury a child. But imagine that that's your only child. Like you don't even have any other children to console you or to uh, put your end. No, 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 that's your only child. So it's, now it's double bad. And then the Bible says, and she was a widow. That's triple bad. This is one of the saddest situations in the Bible. That on this day that we are introduced to this woman, here she is as a widow at her only son's funeral. Just that little statement carries so much weight with it. A widow attending the funeral 
of her only son. Now, her life wouldn't have always been like this, but life can change. And many of you that are part of our church are very young, but I'm telling you, over the course of life, life can change. There would have been a time when this woman would have had better days. There would have been a time when this woman would have been preparing for her wedding. The Bible says she's a widow. That means she would have got married. So she would have been preparing for her wedding. When people are getting married, it's an exciting time. It's a hopeful time. Weddings are one of the... They are stressful, uh, and if you make it more stressful, you're trying to compete and have a, an Instagram wedding. But, you know, we understand weddings are, are exciting, stressful in a good way times. And when you come, you see the bride looking beautiful, the groom looking smart, the family is there, there's food, there's laughing, there's joy, there's thankfulness to what God has done. This wedding, one day this woman uh, in, in her past would have had this wedding day, and it would have been an amazing day a highlight probably of her life that as a young girl she was hoping for this thing and it came she got married then uh, not long after that we don't know but she would have felt her body changing and maybe I'm pregnant and then uh, 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 her body confirms that that she is pregnant and she still tells her husband I'm pregnant and the husband would be like that's so great I can't imagine and inside he's thinking oh maybe we could have a son first I, I'd like to have a son and then a daughter but I don't mind as long as the child is healthy and then on the day of the birth the son is born he's a son and he's so happy and so here is this woman in her history in her life here is this woman who was married, wonderful wedding, wonderful marriage, a healthy child, a son and a husband and thinking this is how life is going to be. And then things start to change. We don't know why the husband died, whether he had a disease or whether he, there was an accident or whether someone killed him, but he died. And now she finds herself as a widow. Now, the thing that she thought her and her husband would have lived out, she's found herself no longer married, no longer in this relationship with this guy, no longer uh, 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 just hopeful about the future. But as bad as it is, she's got her son. And so she's, she's processing that. She's been to the, the graveside already to see her husband buried. But she's like, you know what, I've got my son. But then something happens to the son. Again, we don't know whether the son got sick or whether it is hereditary, whether it was the same thing that killed the father. We don't know what it is. But then the son dies and we would have met this woman very soon after that happened because they would bury uh, their dead of this, uh, the, the next day. This, is, this, has, to, this has to move quick um, in Bible times. And so we've met this woman. This is what we see. We see this woman in our text when the best things in her life are now in graves. When the best thing in her life is now being put in a coffin. When the best thing, all of her hopes and her strength and her future is now in a box. See, it is the natural part of life to put hopeless things in a box. That's what that's natural. That's what we do. When things become hopeless, when we go through situations and we this is just hopeless. There's no hope for this. There's no way this is going to change. We start to put it in a box. Some of us because of hopeless situations, because of what we've gone through, we've start to put life in a box. We're living in a box. We've started to put other people in a box. We've started to say, that's how they are. That's just how they are. That's how it is. And we've put them in a box. I believe that this is some of the problems that we're having today in our society because people are misunderstood and people are hurt and people are angry. And we're starting to put people in a box. They're all like that. That's how they are. What we're saying is we're putting them in a box. When I see you, if you look like them, then you're like that. You've put everybody in the same box box sometimes we when we go through things even as christians and even in church we don't have the best experience someone's let us down someone's forgotten us someone's we start to put the whole church in a box yeah this is the way the church is i'm not sure if i'm going back this this is the way we are we, when we go through hope it's natural that when you see a hopeless situation we put it in a box some of us have put ourselves in a box we've let ourselves down we've made mistakes we've done things that were shameful to speak about or think about we would not want nobody to know things that we've done we start to put ourselves in a box 
we start to say that, you know what, this is just the way life is. This is just the way I am. This is the way I'm always going to be. Uh, you, you hear people's speech. Oh, I'm just like that. No, I'm no good with people. No, I, I can't do that. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm never, I, I'm too. Uh, what you've done is you're putting yourself in a box. Yes, we admit that some of these labels help us to kind of identify uh, characteristics, whether someone is uh, an introvert or an extrovert. But I want to tell you, don't allow man's labels to become your box. If that was the case, I would not be pastoring because if I look at uh, all of the, the social signs that I radiate, I should not be a pastor because I, 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 I prefer to be by myself. I prefer to all of these things. But God called me. And we see that many times God calls men that do not feel that they are equipped for the situation. We see it with Moses. We see it with Jeremiah. We see this all throughout the scriptures that you can't put yourself in a box. It's what Moses did. And when God calls him, he's putting himself in a box. Why? Because after 40 years in Egypt, didn't really accomplish anything, then murder somebody, then get exposed. And so he's been on the wilderness for 40 years. He's just put himself in a box. I'm not a deliverer. I'm not serious. You start to put your calling in a box that you you believe God can no longer use you. You're going to focus in on this or focus in on that. And your calling is in a box. Some of you, God has called you to do great things for him. He's called you to be on the front line. He's called you as a pastor, pastor's wife. He's called you as an evangelist and a missionary. He's called you to be a leader and he's called you to lead a Bible study or to uh, uh, do something for him. But because of a hopeless situation, you've put your calling in a box. One of the saddest things is that we start to put God in a box. We start to believe the only way that God can move is like this. And we start to believe that we figured God out. That That's really what we're saying is that we figured God out. Oh, yeah, God doesn't quite work like that. Be very careful uh, that you, your, 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 your disappointments are not bleeding into your faith see uh we've got to be careful even in this season church where we have we've been on lockdown and we've said okay you know what let's not go to church let's let's uh, only have online services and let's do that and we start to put god in a box where we no longer believe god can protect or heal i'm not speaking about foolishness but i'm saying we can't just live our lives in fear Putting God in a box, well, God, you know, that's the only way God can move because the government said this and the government said that. I'm not advocating rebellion and rioting and doing what you want, but I'm saying we cannot just put God in a box because we've gone through this, 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 this situation. See, Jesus collides with this woman driven by compassion. That's why Jesus has to collide with us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. That he, he sent Jesus on a mission. Jesus collided with this, with sin, with sinners, with lost situation. That's what Jesus' mission is, is to collide. That this thing is going on course. And Jesus is like, nah, I can't let you go on anymore. Hopeless. I cannot just stand back and allow this funeral to pass me by. I have to collide with it. The Bible says in verse 13 of our text, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. God sees what you're going through. God sees that you had your good days and it switched on you and now you're in the lowest day. God sees that you've put all of these things, people, yourself, God in a box. God sees and he has moved with compassion. He didn't just be like, okay, let this go. People die. That's the way it is. All right, let's go on with mission and make disciples and reach the lost and uh, plant churches. No, no. Jesus sees you. We do have a vision. Reach the lost, make disciples, plant churches, but also God sees what people are going through. He sees the fears, the anxiety, the hopelessness. He sees this and he is moved with compassion. And the Bible says in verse 14 that he came and touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still. Jesus stops this woman's box. That's what he does. Here, here is this woman. All our hope is in this box. Jesus stops it. Jesus is going to touch the parts of our life which are hopeless. That's what he's going to do. He wants the uh, touch where we've put everything in a box and we've started to live in a box. Jesus is going to stop those things. And uh, he's like, no, 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 I, I can't do this. I'm not going to allow this to continue anymore. Some of us, we want Jesus to come in our box. 
No, no, Jesus won't get in the box. What Jesus does is he stops the box. And actually what he does is he speaks a word and that which we've put in the box, Jesus pulls it out of the box. Jesus brings life. He stops. And the Bible says that here are these men. He touches the coffin. He touches the box and he says, uh, this ain't going no further. And, he, and the Bible says that they that carried him, they stood still. See, this is the problem with box thinking is that you always need people to carry you. And God's like, no, 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 I don't want people carrying you anymore. You're going to come alive now. I'm going to bring life into this situation. There are things that you've been carrying and things that you've expected people to carry you and there's things that you couldn't do. And God's like, no, I'm bringing life to this. I'm bringing life to this situation. See, what God wants to do is he wants you to get out of the box Jesus is all about life outside the box. What do we say to people when they are so limited? We say, you need to think outside of the box. That's basically, box thinking is limited thinking. That's what it's all about. Jesus was always going to confront box thinking. This is why the Pharisees and the Sadducees could not receive him because they had put God in a box. Yes, God had given them the law. Yes, God had chosen uh, these people, the descendants of Abraham, but they had put him in a box. And God says, no, 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 my plan is bigger than that. And Jesus will always challenge box thinking. He's going to stop your box thinking, uh, 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 saint of God. He's not going to allow you to continue like that. He has a bigger plan, a bigger mission, a more glorious end for you. He sees you in this crowd, which is full of sadness, hopelessness, heading towards a cemetery. And he says, I want to enroll you in my crowd. I want to bring you into my discipleship. See, outside of the box, this is where we no longer are talking uh, about we can't do it. It won't work. It's just the way it is. That's, that's, that's box thinking Jesus is going to give us outside of the, that thing. What Jesus is going to do, and I'm speaking this into some people's life, that he's going to save people in your surrounding, in your sphere of influence that you never thought could get saved. He's going to save family members. He's going to save um, parents and children. He's going to save sons. And he's going uh, he's gonna, to he's gonna bring them into the kingdom of God in such a way that you couldn't imagine. He's going to ignite them, set them on fire, not just save them to come to church and attend and to be, you know, some little uh, pretty Christian to sit on the front and warm a seat. No, no, he's going to save them, get them on fire and use them for his glory. He's going to make them one of the most effective Christians that we've ever seen in our churches. Because he's like, listen, what I'm going to do is outside of the box. God wants to do uh, new things in your life, move you in new dimensions, new dimensions of ministry, new dimensions of what God has for you. Some of you, you've planned your life, it's in a box, but Jesus is going to, uh, like he did with this woman, he's going to touch the box. He's going to stop it because some of us, we've just, we've just allowed the world to carry us in a direction. Some of you are just, eh, that's just the way life is. I'm just going to go through this. And God is like, no, it, it doesn't have to work like that. I'm stopping that. I'm doing a new thing. I've got new adventures for you, new places to go, new ministries, new uh, horizons. That he's like, no, 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 that's inside the box. I'm going to take you outside of the box. Uh, I've, many, many times I've told you as the church that uh, coming to Wandsworth wasn't my plan. That wasn't like uh, five years before I came to Wandsworth. That's my plan. I'm going to do this. It wasn't my plan even to be a pastor. I had my own thing and I'm just being carried and this is the way I think it works. And if you're going to be a, this and that, and uh, that's how my mind is. But what I realize is that looking back now that God came and he touched the box. And he spoke and something changed in me. Let me tell you right now, some of you, God is going to pull your marriage out of the box. Some of you, have, you've put your marriage in a box. Yes, you're a Christian. Yes, you love God. But because of struggles in the early days of marriage, you start to put your marriage in a box and you just thought, ah, I guess that's just the way it is. And because you're a Christian, you think, you know what, I shouldn't get a divorce. So I'm just going to, let's just stay together and we're just going to, uh, get by and for the kids sake and God is saying no 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 no. I'm going to pull your marriage out of the box this thing is going to be the most blessed thing that you'd have in your life he's going to turn it around because he wants to he wants you to think outside the box he wants you to live outside of the box he wants you to experience him 
outside of the box. And I could go on and on and on and on and on and on. See, what Jesus is saying to us today is that it's not over yet. You've had your highs, you've had your lows. He's saying the highs are coming back again. He said it's not over yet. It's not over yet. Some of you have been hoping for things for weeks, months, years, a decade. And it's like, ah, let's just put it in the box. Let's pack it away. Let's put it into storage. And God's like, no, 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 no. We're not doing that. He says, do not weep. What he's saying is when he says do not weep, he's saying there is hope. He's communicating to us there is hope. He's saying to that woman, do not weep. There's hope. This is going to change. Let me, let me uh, close with this. Jesus collides with this funeral and he turns it into a revival. And he does it with just speaking 10 words. That's all he says. I counted them. 10 words. And the first three words are the title of the sermon. Do not weep. See, before he does anything, he says these words. Do not weep. Before he says anything. He just tells the woman, "Do not. it's not like he, 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 he resurrected the son and the son is there and he's to put them together and he said, no, don't weep. Now, before he does anything, he says, do not weep. And one thing I understand about God is most of the time, uh, before he does anything, he speaks a word. He begins with a word, with a command, with an instruction. That's how God begins. Even in Genesis, we see from the very beginning, what does God begin with? A word. He speaks. And then there's there's life in here. And the Bible says in our uh, 13 and 14 of our text, he said, do not weep. Then he came and touched. He spoke the word first. Then he came and touched. See, what can happen sometimes is we lose our reverence for the word. We start to take the word lightly oh yeah it's a word yeah the, the, the word but not realizing that he begins with a word see because we're not seeing anything there's a word he's spoken but we haven't seen anything yet we start oh, just the word do not weep okay do not weep but you know what's going to change i haven't seen anything change jesus told her do not weep before he changed anything See, God will always speak to us before he speaks to the situation. So many times. I really do believe I can almost say always. God can do it. But I'm not going to put God in a box so he can do what he wants. But as we look through uh, scriptures and experience of people's lives is that God speaks before he changes the situation. Think about Abraham. God calls Abraham and he says, Abraham, come out of your land. I'm going to make you all of this and that. But he didn't make him all of that all of a sudden. and said, now come with me. He said, no, he spoke first. Command, the word. He changed his name. He called him uh, Abraham. Changed his name. His name meant, you know, to be a father. Before he actually changed the, the, the Abraham situation. Before Abraham ever saw uh, Isaac, God changed his name. See, God is going to speak to the Christian before he reaches the sinner. God always speaks to the Christian before he reaches the sinner. See, the Bible speaks about us being called to go and tell the sinner. Every revival in all of history has begun because the church, have, as the church has heard God speak and they have repented and sought him. Then the sinner gets saved. We, there isn't a revival where sinners just start prophesying in pubs and walking into churches. For no, 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 no. We see that every revival, it begins with God speaking, the church hearing. See, God is going to speak to you, Christian, so that he can save those around you that don't know him. What is God saying to you? Is he spoken a word already and he's waiting for you and me to repent, get things right? and seek him because he's saying i want to save those around you i'm speaking first do not weep god will speak to you many times before he changes your spouse you know i, I want that woman to change pastor 
But God has spoken to you. Do not weep. He's spoken things to you. You need to do a few things. And then he says, I'll change her. I'll change him. Wife, I'm speaking to you. And then I'll change him. Parents. Many times God is going to speak to you before he changes your children. We're like, oh, these kids are just wearing me out. God needs to speak to us first. Do not weep. And then he's going to change. See, we've got to hold on to his word. If he's spoken, we've got to go deeper in his word and realize this word is what I'm going to hold on to because I believe he's going to change the situation. Uh, In the Bible, uh, we see uh, 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 delayed doesn't mean denied. Delayed, it doesn't mean denied. Do not weep. It's not Jesus just saying stop crying. When I was a kid... um, you know, you get told off, you get disciplined, you start crying, and then you, you know, you, get, uh, you start crying out of control. I don't know if you ever did this where you're, <laughs> you can't speak, and what, what, what's the matter with you? <laughs> that type of thing. Um, and uh, I won't name names, I'll uh, incriminate anybody. Uh, but there are times when you'll be like, why well, you stop crying? Stop crying. If you don't stop crying, I'll give you something to cry about. Uh, maybe some of you had that old school uh, instructions. This is not what Jesus is doing. Jesus is not like, oh, stop crying. No, 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 no. What Jesus is saying, this is code. When Jesus says, do not weep, it's code for, I'm about to change the situation. Some of you here, Jesus is saying this to you. Listen, do not weep. I'm about to change the situation. Jesus wants to collide with the hopelessness in your life. Jesus wants to collide with your hopeless situation. Jesus wants to collide with the things that you've put in a box. Jesus wants to come in. And basically, like I said in the beginning, life is going to have victory over death in our experience. This is what Jesus wants to do. Do not weep. Let's hold on to his word. Let's believe God. Uh, let's just take some time to pray. Let me speak to some people here. Maybe you're not a Christian, you're not saved. And like what I said in the beginning of the message, you're in the crowd following the widow. You're being led by this world. You're being led by your flesh and by the sin, but you're not being led by Jesus. And um, Jesus sees that the way this is heading, this is taking you to the cemetery. That's it. It's it's taking you to the cemetery. And you start to see these things are playing out in your life. Maybe you're backslidden. Maybe you was once in church, loving God, loving your family, doing the right thing. But as it is today, you've forsaken God and you're going in a direction. You're losing things. You're losing family and ministry and all of these things. Whether you're not saved or you're backslidden, I want to say Jesus still is moved with compassion for your, comp- with your situation. And he says, listen, you need to bring me in. You need to bring me into your life. You need to allow Jesus in. Allow him to collide with you. Allow him, allow him to collide with your heart. And as I'm speaking, things are, uh, uh, God is tugging at you. He's pulling at you. You're feeling this. I want to tell you, it's not my oratory skills. It's not my wisdom. It's the spirit of God speaking to you. Be sensitive to this and we want to lead you in a prayer and say this with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Please forgive me. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Help me to know you and live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Christian, be hopeful. Receive this word and and take it. uh, Let God Take this in and go into your word and hold on to that and say, you know what? I'm no longer going to put things in a box. I'm going to follow Jesus with an expectation of life. I have a living hope. That's what I am. And let's stay focused on him during this season uh, of ups and downs and who knows what the future holds and so many things going on. But we know who holds the future. And let's continue with Jesus. Amen.